Welcome to the Metamorphosis Podcast, hosted by Erin Howe in the United States and myself, Nora Brucker in Germany. In this podcast, we talk to people about transformation and the moments and events that change us. We hope you enjoy. It is my pleasure to talk to Lex Vuko in this episode. Lex was born in Serbia and spent her teenager years during the turbulent times of the Yugoslavian War. When she was 17, part of her family fled to Venezuela, and Lex herself later on went to the United States for school. She didn't leave until only a few years back. That's when Lex actually came back to Serbia. In this episode, Lex talks about experiencing war and leaving everything she knew behind, she ventures deep into what she felt when in 1999 the U.S. military started bombing her hometown Belgrade and what it felt like to live through these moments of utter devastation and bone-deep fear. So what was the war actually all about? From 1991 to 2001, the former Yugoslavia found itself to be the theater of several separate but related ethnic conflicts, which ended up in the final breakup of the Yugoslavian states. The war took place in Serbia, Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Montenegro, Macedonia and the Kosovo. The Yugoslavian war is often described as the deadliest conflict in Europe since World War II and has been the setting of horrific war crimes, including genocide. Conflict in the state has been a permanent constant of the people living in it. In the early 90s, nationalism was rising among various groups. At that time, the Serbian president Milosevic thought more power over the different republics and actually secured himself four out of eight federal votes in comparison to one vote for each other republic. With this power, he heavily influenced the decision-making of the state. When first Croatia and Slovenia declared independence in 91, the Yugoslavian government declared the decision illegal and supported the Yugoslavian People's Army to secure the unity the first of several wars started. What followed were years of destruction, hard-fought battles, as well as a massive amount of people seeking refuge in other countries. And like all of the conflicts in the world, this one was also fought on the back of the people. Since the war did not happen all at once, but had different battle scenes as well as different conflicts, the end of the war was also not one final peaceful decision, but several different solutions. Not all of them have been fully resolved, though. The war in Yugoslavia cannot really be described in just a few words. But Lex's own experience can at least give somewhat of an expression of what life was actually like in former Yugoslavia and what it is like now in current Serbia. Well, I was born and raised in Eastern Europe, and when I was 17, I moved to the United States. There's a little bit of a story before that. When I was 16, actually, I got hit by a car, um, and from that night, my, my life was never the same. I knew one sort of life, one kind of life until I was 16, and from that point on, it was surgeries, hospitals, rehabs, and on the day I got out, um, of the rehab center for my ankles, uh, bombing started in Serbia. So that went on for another few months. Um, I went to Venezuela with my mom and during that time and then ended up in the United States to finish high school. I stayed in the United States for the next 20 years. And about a couple of years ago, I moved back to Serbia. And then now we're moving again to Mexico. So <laughs> I'm like a grasshopper ever since I was 16. Yeah, lots to talk about, definitely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's go back a little bit to you growing up in Serbia. Um, sure. I'm pretty sure that probably a lot of people out there have ac actually not really any idea of like what growing up in that country was like in like the 80s and the 90s. And so um, mm -hmm. maybe you can give us a little bit of a background information and what, what it was actually like for you. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, it's just funny. It's so true because, like, you grow up and that's the normal. That's, that's your normal. And you don't realize that 
that's not necessarily normal for people, which my story is not as crazy as some people who've actually been through the actual war. Mm. But I was born in 82. And right away when I was eight, like in early 90s, 89, 90 is when things started really falling apart. This country was called Yugoslavia at the time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. there were different states within it, different countries now that are different nationalities, different religion background and different political views. And so things started really changing when I was really young. So, you know, we at that age, you go through that just like any other kid. Like you just try to make the best of it. You don't really understand what adults are doing. No. And I remember... I just remember a whole bunch of people escaping from Bosnia at the time and moving to Serbia. So like all of a sudden our city started having a ton of people that stayed with families that just tried to find a place to stay that they were escaping a war. And all you could hear about is war, 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 war. It was all over the news. And again, this was like no social media time. Yeah. So you you hear what you hear, you see what you see. And then in 93, I remember it was really crazy as far as economy goes. For example, Mm. a Serbian currency is called dinar. And they transferred everything to Deutschmarks, actually, because Deutschmark was stable at the time. So my father, who is a doctor, um, would receive his salary every once in a while. He wasn't (laughs) regular at the time. And he would call my mom and say, do I transfer to Deutschmarks right now or when I get home? And she would say, transfer now. It's seven Deutschmarks right now. By the time you get home, it's going to be six. So just to give an idea, this is a doctor getting his salary for a month of worth of work. That's six Deutschmarks, which is like $3 maybe. Yeah. You know, I remember not. You know, there were no flour. There, there was no flour. There was no oil, there was no sugar, there was no just basic things that people lived with. And I remember, you know, like at the time, again, I was a kid, I remember standing in line with my friend waiting for bread for three hours. And, you know, that was, you know, we were kids, we didn't understand what was going on. But looking back, I seriously have no idea how people made it through. I really yeah. don't. Yeah. Experiencing a war actually in your country is obviously very, very different than hearing about it or be even participating in a war in other countries. It's just, you know, experiencing all of that, the poverty and the lack of food and also the fear that obviously all of the residents have, right? Yes, yes because you just don't, like, your life is not in your control. Yeah. When these bigger powers are talking about a war and bombing and you see people constantly being going to war, you know, also let me mention that men from 18 to 65 couldn't leave the country. So even if you wanted to leave the country, if you had the means to, like, you have to leave half of your family behind. And then, you know, seeing people with like all sorts of injuries and issues and like hearing yeah. their stories, it's just so crazy to, again, like you think that that's okay. Like you think that that's normal, you know, and I, I, I know that it's hard for people to get that, but it's just, you know, under hearing other people's stories is really powerful because I remember years before that seeing bombing and I can't remember this was somewhere in Middle East and going, wow, I can't even imagine how crazy that would be. Well, little did I know, a few years later, I got to experience that. Yeah. That was 93 as far as the economy goes. And then things kind of calmed down, started getting slightly better. But in 1999, Belgrade, the city where I was from, was bombed. So that was my war experience. And again, that was right when I got out of my, my rehabilitation for my ankle and that I can talk about when you can't, when it comes to serious fear of not knowing what's happening, because you just, you all of a sudden you hear sirens and I get so teary talking about this. It's okay. Because it's so crazy when you don't know if you're going to be alive in the next five minutes and whoever you see, you don't know if you'll ever see them yeah. again. And that's what's so crazy about being in a war. And this is why I'm so anti-war for any reason. A war is never needed. There's always too many young people suffering. And then, you know, now this is 20 years later. I didn't live here for 20 years. But you start seeing 
so many sick people with cancer mm-hmm. and all kinds of issues. They're relating it back to what happened and what was really dropped in those bombs 20 years ago. Of course. So this is really crazy when you think about it, because when you when I lived in the United States, you know, for the most part, like you, you have your life in your own hands. You control it. You may not agree with government, but you also have the, a lot of freedom to move where you want, to earn what you want, to do what you want, where it's not like that in other countries, right? Mm-hmm. So like, especially when, when there's bombing going on, we have these political issues over your head. You're just like, I, I can't think of a 10-year goal right now, right? Like I'm, I'm trying to make it through this without a bomb falling on my head. And I lived in the center in downtown Belgrade, which is exactly where they bombed the most because they bombed um, military institutions. And yeah, so that was a really, really really uncertain time of my life, which, you know, it, it's just crazy to even think about that. Like, it's crazy to think but that that's like a chapter of my life. What's, you know, then it's not just countries dividing. You have families dividing. You have people that are different. They're mixed marriages, basically. Like yeah. in, your, in the United States, they have issue with races, right? Here, it's nationalities. So you mm. had families that didn't know where to go didn't know where to go so that they can be safe. You had uh, yeah. one person that was Croatian, one person that was Serbian. And it's like, wh- where do we go to be safe? Because Bosnia was a mix of them all. And that's mm. where the war was going on. So a lot of families fled. A lot of families actually separated because yeah. they didn't know any better. And I know a story of my, my brother had a friend whose father was I, I believe his father was Croatian and his mother was Serbian or, or vice versa. And he was so depressed with everything going on when they called him to military, he committed suicide. He did not, he could not be on the opposite side of half of his family. So when we're talking about dividing countries, we're talking about dividing people. And Germany yeah. knows this from eighties where the war, when the wall fell, right? Yeah. Up until 89, we were divided. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and the more people are divided, the easier the control is. I understand where that's coming from. Mm. It's just very sad to see people not not know where to go and not know where they feel safe based on where, who they were born in, what they were born into. Experiencing a war on your own turf is not only affecting those people who are living it while it's going on, but a country that used to be a modern war zone leaves not only bad memories, but also a changed landscape. It's been 75 years since World War II ended in the European theater. Still, even in 2020, about once a month, if not more often, parts of my region in Germany are evacuated because bombs and mines from war times have to be removed and destroyed in a controlled way. It is estimated that there are still 10,000 bombs under German soil. Children I grew up with found landmines at the river, and only a few years ago, workers at a construction site in my little hometown accidentally hit a bomb that exploded and left many injured. The landscape has been changed forever. There are still bunkers all over Europe, as well as under some houses. And small cities still have the sirens installed that signaled approaching bombers. If we are still feeling the World War II war zone, even today, can you imagine what it must be like for countries like Serbia, who had another war just 20 years ago? I want to paint a picture for people what it's like to to talk about bombing. You know, you the day I got out of that rehab center, it was about 1 or 2 p.m. And everybody's talking about possible bombing, you know, and all of it, already it's like funny feeling in your belly, but you're like, nah, that's that's not going to happen. And 8 p.m., the first sirens went off. And just the sound of those sirens is enough to just get you in such an unbelievable state it's not just panic. It's, it's, you know, we talk about like brain not knowing, like your brain gets paralyzed when it doesn't know what's coming, like when it's unknown. When you're talking yeah. about an unknown, when it comes to bombing, like you don't even know what to expect, you know? And mm-hmm. that's when, like you said, like the basements here are not like basements in the United States. Oh, I wish so. Here you have like old mattresses and dust and things that people threw away for the last few years and rats 
And then when bombing started, when you hear mm. the sirens, you've got to go down to the basement and you have to stay there for as long as the other sirens, for as long as you don't hear the other sirens. So you may hear planes in the meantime, you may hear the sounds. And the crazy thing is after a few weeks of all that panic and distortion, people start functioning almost back to normal. So I would go to my grandmother's house, she and I would go into her balcony, and from the balcony I would actually watch bombs falling down and 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 destroying things. And that that was really surreal too. But at some wow. point, like the body, your mind and your body just can't handle it for so long. After a few weeks, you're like, Yeah, I you can't be in that state anymore. So you just kind of continue living to the best of your ability. So that was insane. Mm-hmm. I remember that. I remember watching the bombs fall. And it, it it's amazing to see something destroyed within seconds. And it's it's crazy to even think. But at that point, you don't want to think like, oh, this can fall on me. You're just trying to live through the moment. You're really just trying to wait it out and live through the moment. That's very true. I mean, obviously, for you, you know, you went through already a bad experience with getting hit by a car and going right. through, you know, all of the recovery and everything. Um, and that was the point also where, you know, your family kind of realized we want, we want our kids to have a better life. Right. Right. So I went, it was typical for people to go and finish high school in the United States when my country was like, mm. so whatever. And So I did that, and then I wanted to come back to Serbia, which at that time, my parents decided, yeah, like, it's better off that she stays there. And at that moment, once again, I felt out of control because I was promised that no matter what, I'll be able to come home. In a long run, that was the best thing that could have happened to me because I had to, I felt alone and I was alone. But it was the best thing because I was stripped and I had to rebuild myself back up. Mm. Um, what 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 I talked about with my dad a few years ago about that. And, you know, he said, well, you even if you came back, you probably would have left for United States again. I said, yeah, but it would have been my decision. So for a few years of my late teens, early 20s, I felt like I was completely out of control when it comes to my own life. I felt like everybody else was making decisions for me in my life. And in the process of rebuilding myself from that, I never gave away my power again. You know, like I, I I want to know that I'm responsible for everything that I do in my life and others can have an opinion, but ultimately it is my choice. And that was a, yeah. the biggest lesson for me. So you went to Venezuela first and then you finished high school in America? Yes. So during the war, when things were like just not settling, And about a month later, my mom was just having a really hard time dealing with everything, especially I was still limping. You know, I was still even though I was done with rehab for my ankles, like I still had, you know, issues. So my mom was, you know, watching me on my crutches going down the stairs to the basement and coming back up and she was just losing it. So my brother had a family that could take us in Venezuela for the time being while the war is still going on. So she and I left and my dad couldn't leave the country because he was below the age of 65. Yeah. And that was really heartbreaking as, you know, I remember because we had to take a bus, you know, I couldn't fly a plane at the time. We had to take a bus. And I just remember leaving him there thinking, God, like, I have no idea if he's going to be here when I, when we come back, I don't even know if this country is going to be here, like literally. And we were in Venezuela for about three months and we made the best of it. You know, my mom, it was me, me and my mom. And, you know, I learned the language and, We, we, you know, try to make the best of it. We, you know, try to go grocery shopping, cooking, all that normal stuff. Um, pretending in a way at times that, you know, the war is not going on where I'm from. And after that, I went, I went to Serbia, repacked, and then met, went to the United States. And seriously, I remember coming to the United States going, can I just please unpack somewhere? Because for the last year, I have been living out of my suitcase. And that's like, that's when I settled in the United States and went to finish high school, stayed for college and so on. So uh, tell us a little bit more about the life that you, um, you know, had in America. And you stayed quite a while, right? I stayed for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So 
uh, first few years were really, really dark for me because I, again, felt abandoned and rejected by my family. And I, I really didn't get along with my brother. Um, I felt like I was alone. I had nobody to talk to, nobody to give me a, you know, sense of hope, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was, again, after everything that went on, I suddenly found myself alone and trying to figure things out. So the first, I'm going to say, five to six years were really hard figuring out, you know, dealing with a culture shock, figuring out how different life is, what life is about here, how to move on from my past. Um, And I started working out. And, you know, working out is like seriously one of the ways to like, build your self-confidence. So I got into boxing and kickboxing because for all those years, I was so angry and I had to channel all that energy somewhere. So I started boxing and kickboxing and that was great for about three years. But once I learned to channel my anger and I realized I'm not a fighter, it was time to move on. And I transferred my love of fitness to actually being at a gym and um, loved it so much that I became a trainer. And that's when I moved to Tennessee and worked as a trainer and then opened my own studio. So I started working as a fitness coach, fitness trainer, and I had that business for about eight years. This that's the biggest transformation is when I started working out and I started changing my mindset, because I truly believe that as you strengthen your body, you strengthen your mind. And that's when I started listening to more motivational stuff, inspirational stuff. And I came across people who would share their story of overcoming hardship. And, you know, you start feeling like, oh, okay, I'm not the only one. Things can work out, you know, and that's like a seed of hope. And you start building from there. And then you start building your confidence more and more through reading books, through surrounding yourself with good people and and so, you know, I ran my business and those were really, really, truly years of transformation for me. You know, I went to seminars. I read a lot. I started studying a lot on how the brain works and our mindset. And I can truly say that, like, who I was when I was 20 is somebody I don't I don't even know if I recognize anymore. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope it's for like that for everybody, right? Because that means we've we've changed. Yeah, we grew. Hopefully, we grew. Yeah. yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so, what made you eventually move back to Serbia? Like, what was that decision? So, it, it was a combination of things, but one of them was a really cute story that I well, I first felt a nudge that it was time to move on to something else from fitness because. Everything led to mindset. And I felt like people that were coming to train with me were getting results while they were training with me, but I didn't have the tools and the means to help them make that permanent shift, Mm. truly learn to love and accept themselves. And that led me to mindset coaching. But um, to back up a little bit, I actually had, um, uh, before I left Serbia, you know, uh, a guy I was dating, I never... I never forgot him in a way and searched for him every few years, every couple, three months. Now social media was there. <laughs> no, social media was there. No, you would just ask who you know, like you mutual yeah. friends. But nobody knew anything. And then when social media boomed, I started searching for him. And I was like, you know, Serbia is still behind when it comes to social media. So, you know, I would search, but I'm like, I, I highly doubt that he's there. Well, once I started really seriously thinking about where I'm going to go next, is when I found him, I came across him on on Facebook, of course, both places, and (laughs) we connected, and we really hit it off, and um, I came because my my father was having a hip surgery, hip replacement surgery, so I came, and I saw him, and we just hit it off, and we're like, okay, this is it, like, we are, we want to be together, and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't come to the United States just like that, and I already had a feeling that it's time to move to the next chapter, so I ended up selling my business and moving back to Serbia, where we started our family. But then now we're talking about moving to Mexico. So, so uh, I, you know, it's it's like I always thought of Serbia of my, you know, my home in a way. And once I came here, I just recognized and realized how much I've changed, mm. how much this is not me anymore. So that girl that was 20 years old that left or 17 
that was not me. And I can't find myself here. And my husband has, he's from here too, but he, he's ready to leave too. He's ready to see the world and meet new people and do new things. So we're talking about moving to Mexico next year. What is Serbia like right now? Like what, what was it like when you actually came back, like with all of these memories? I don't know if you visited over the time, but obviously, you know, in, in, in your mind, you still had those memories, the images, you know, when you left of a war zone. So what was it like yes. to actually come back? Great question, because it's actually very complex. I came back a few times to visit, but it was all for about a week. Mm. So I would just see the people that I wanted to see and go back. And so I never, you know, it's like you visit place. You don't get the feeling of what it's like to live there. Yeah. Now, living in United States for 20 years, I also adapted a mindset of, you know, things that I was used to in the United States. I just expected them to be in Serbia too. <laughs> like, you know, unlimited Wi-Fi and, you know, AC. Like, mm -hmm. And then we move into a place that has no AC and you're like, what? I can't, I don't know how to function, you know? Welcome to Europe, baby. <laughs> Welcome to Europe. Yes, yes. And everything's so small and you're used to space in the United mm -hmm. States, you know? And it's just interesting when you travel because you really realize who, how much you've changed. So when I moved here, I had really high hopes. I had high hopes that, you know, it's been 20 years. Things have got to change. Things have had to change. And... I was very quickly finding myself very disappointed. Mm. Um, a lot of things, I think this uh, this was my observation. Serbian people have lived in survival mode for so long yeah. that that's almost as if the only thing that they know. Mm. So they're great at having a good time. Now, don't get me wrong, because, you know, they, you got to have a good time. Yeah. Um, but the mentality deeper behind that first facade, you find that it's still survival. Um, you still, you know, you see jobs that they people have and the mindset behind it. And, you know, my mind, like, I'm, I'm like, always searching for new ideas, always searching for things to grow myself and my business and how to help more people. And I see how limited mindset of people is here because they've never been exper exposed to anything else, you know? So Serbia was socialist decades ago. And yeah. socialist means everything's basically government owned. Um, so, you know, like a shoe store, a grocery store, everything was government owned when I was growing up. But what that does is it, it, it kills work ethic. Because everybody mm. stay the same, whether they do their job or not, basically. And so I see the the the, the try in, in, in shifting that. I see the country trying to shift that to more privatized things. But everything's still based on socialism and everything's still based on that mindset. Would you say, and that is sometimes something that I actually think about, like, uh, you know, with some of the conflicts that we had here in Europe, um, sometimes it seems like a lot of the things that happened during that war and, you know, that eventually led into, you know, the separation of the countries and everything, like not everything has been really worked through, you know, like no. a lot of things I felt like were just left open, like everybody was divided and then they were like, you know, find your own way and live your own way. And whatever happened in that war, in including some war crimes, obviously, yes. were just like... Not really yes. worked through. I'm getting like goosebumps as you talk about this. Well, first, let's just back up a little bit and see how funny this hist history of this country is. Serbia mm. and Croatia are two countries that are next door to each other. Yeah, They have been against each other in World War Number One. After yes. World War Number One, they go ahead and form a country together. <laughs> Step number yeah. one, right? Step number one. World War II breaks off. They are on mm -hmm. opposite sides once again. They fight each yeah. other once again. War passes. They keep create a country called Yugoslavia. Now, it's not just, you know, of course, people that live here. It's politics and it's politicians. It's a yes. lot more involvement than that. Um, but they created the country again. So what happened? 50, another 50 years later, here's a third War. war and yeah you know, and, and and i'm, I'm I, I you know i'm saying this from loving from loving place 
please do not make this another country again together because yeah. we're better, we get along better separately. I will say that because of that and because of, of course, political messages involved, people tend to really enforce as to who they are, you know, national. Mm. And that politics, of course, has a big part in it and, and wants to have a big part in it because it separates people. Of course. And and that's really, really sad to see. And then and in the south of Serbia, there's Kosovo too, which is borderline with the Albanian. Yes. Same thing. Same thing. Nationalist, um, fighting over the space, fighting over territory. And um, nothing, nothing really gets resolved. It really doesn't get resolved. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's human nature in a way, because people really don't yeah. want to get into things, right? Like, Nobody was true. We don't want to. We don't yeah. want to think about our own faults and stuff like that. Exactly, and you know, and it's so much easier to blame the other side. So yeah. you're right. A lot of things got unfinished. A lot of people benefited from the war. A lot of people still probably benefit from a lot of suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, which, which again makes me so sad because it's really the people. A lot of times are so conditioned to fight for who they are instead of saying, wait a minute, yeah. we're all humans. We all have feelings and families and the life. So how can we make this the best solution possible? How yes. can we all live in peace? You know? Yeah. So that's, I think that's yeah, why yeah. things don't get resolved. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I was just wondering about that because obviously, you know, you still hear, you, you know, you still hear a lot of things. And Germany has been, you know, one of those countries as well, where a lot of people from Yugoslavia obviously immigrated to during the wartime. And so, um, yeah. you know, from knowing people who obviously fled, uh, you know, that was my experience as well, that they always said, like, nothing has really been resolved and no. worked through. And, and you know, the, uh, the craziest thing is people were in war here, right? And then I, when I was in the United States, I would meet people from Bosnia or Croatia and you first, like for me, I have to approach them and be like, are you okay with me being Serbian? Because I don't know what their experiences are. I don't know what their oh, thoughts interesting. are, right? Yeah. yeah. And if they're okay with that, then we can have a conversation. And it's the weirdest thing because now you're becoming friends or having a conversation with somebody who they're our family. Was on the opposite side. To each other in the war. But you know what? The yeah. best that I can do is be friendly to those people, to everybody, because we're to me, we're humans first. I really don't care where we were born, because that's not what we choose. I choose what kind of person am I speaking with and what kind of person I am trying to be. So I'm not like yeah. I'm not big on, you know, where I'm from and my my nationalism, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it can be very dividing. That's very true. I mean obviously, you know, as a German I experienced that a lot. Like we were yeah. not the most like country <laughs> so (laughs) i've experienced that a lot when i was growing up uh, in europe especially oh yeah um yeah that was still like the yeah i can see that a lot of resentment yeah yeah Yeah. and it's unnecessary it is totally unnecessary well that's an interesting thing actually because you know over the past couple of weeks and months you know with everything that has been happening in the world like the way that I grew up, I'm obviously, you know, like two to three generations after World War II, right? Um, and, um, and it was like really drilled into, into us, at least into like what I experienced when Mm -hmm. I was growing up. I know there's other people obviously who say like, we didn't learn enough, but with me, um, I, I still remember like it was drilled into us and, and, um, we were like, made to remember everything and made to like feel the pain that we caused. And while I was growing up and while I was younger, I felt like I didn't do that. And I couldn't be more different than, than, you know, what, whatever the two generations before me did, like I couldn't be more different because I'm against everything, you know, that Germany stood for during that time. So a little bit of the time I was, you know, sometimes I was a little bit resentful of the resentment that was, you know, put towards us you know like like when I grew up like I went to I think it was like in seventh grade or something like that and that was my first time going to France on like a school trip and when we you know when you know we got our, off the bus they greeted us with Heil Hitler oh wow and that was that was <laughs> horrible for me as a child and I didn't understand and so yeah. this resentment was still real and it was going on for a lot of years but now in in hindsight, I feel like because we were made to 
experience what we've caused and we've experienced the resentment and we had to work through all of this. I feel like now I have a better understanding of my country, of history, of not like doing the same mistakes and realizing that in a lot of countries right now, because they did not, you know, go through everything they've done in their past. And there's a lot of countries who caused a lot of damage in the world who've never talked about it, yeah. who never like really worked through it. And so I feel like it made us better. That's a and, very interesting point yeah. of view. Because I would think yeah. I would think that I would think like you where in the beginning where I'd be like, I had nothing to do with what my grandfather did. You know, like mm-hmm. You know, don't put that on me, but I can see how you got an understanding of that. Like, let's not repeat history, right? I just, um, I just, I hope that people don't be, don't feel labeled, you know, like, oh, well, you know, because I I, I had no control over my, what my grandfather did. My, my both grandparents were in World War II and I have no control over what they did, whether it was positive. Like, I have no, I don't even know. But yeah. and I don't want that on me, but I do want the understanding of the situation so that I can yes. have more empathy, sympathy, and yes, that we don't repeat history. Very interesting. Yeah, that was just, you know, something that I've just realized over the past couple of weeks and months, you know. Like, um, and it's actually a very first time in my life that I feel I'm happy to be mm-hmm. German. As a 32-year-old. It's the first time that I've experienced that. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, history is a, is a very fascinating thing, oh, obviously. Yeah. And, you know, both of our countries have a very, you know, rich history, obviously. We've been, we've been there a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I always say. You know, one thing that Serbia has is history. Now, about future, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. That's true. Very true. So tell us a little bit about your plans with Mexico. Why Mexico? I mean, you kind of said you wanted to live in a country, you know, where your time is, you know, uh, is something that you can decide a little bit more on, you know, yourself. But, like, why did you choose Mexico? Well, even when I was still in the United States and I felt the nudge to leave, I would literally open Google Maps, like the world map, and look at places and research places. I literally had no idea where I'm going to go. And so when we when we were in Serbia, my husband and I started talking. We're like, where are we going to go next? And then we started asking ourselves the most important question. Okay, what is important to us? Right? Like I already have a business online, which allows us freedom to go anywhere we want. Um, Uh, we decided that we love warm weather. We love the beach. We love that free lifestyle. We both Mm. don't like winter, which we have here and we both don't enjoy it. And we'll see how our kid does. He's a year and a half. So he has no opinion on on winter yet. Um, And then I started looking into like United States, Florida, because Miami is like in my heart, always has been. And then we'll start looking at different islands and different places. And then I have a couple of friends in Mexico and just mm-hmm. through research. Um, and again, going back to the fact that I was in Venezuela 20 years ago and I really did yeah. fall in love with Spanish. I really always wanted to uh, get back to Spanish. And, um, you know, in the United States, I, I hardly got a chance to speak Spanish. I always, it's always English. And I really always wanted to go back to that. So in really in search for what's important to us and where do we want our son to grow up? What would be the best in our opinion for our son? We chose Mexico, uh, Los Cabos, which is um, uh, a very tourist touristic place uh, for Americans. So it's still Americanized enough <laughs> for me. <laughs> I'm spoiled Americanized. Um, but I can, I can, we can live there speaking English and then slowly learn Spanish. And then my son can grow up in diversity within different cultures, in a way, different races, um, just, just to have different options. And then, of course, still close enough to the United States, because I, I consider myself now, I still consider U.S. my home. Now I, I feel like that's where mm. I truly grew up you know like develop myself so I still have more 
I, I would say at this point, I feel closer to United States than to Serbia. But at the same time, I don't like to limit myself. I want to be in the growth mindset. And, you know, moving to a place you don't know is a little bit uncomfortable. So learning mm-hmm. Spanish, opening eyes to another culture, having my son learn basically two more languages to be as his first one. Um, that's why we chose Mexico. And you know what? Like if we move there and when we move there and if things are not exactly how we want them to be in a year or two, it's going to be time to search for another place. Like we we don't want to feel limited to where we are. We want to find a place. Of course, wherever you move, it's going to have good and bad. But we want to move to a place that has a lot more good than bad um, in what we're looking for. And that's the most important question is what do we want? Yeah. That's great. That's fantastic. And obviously a great uh, thing, you know, great way of thinking of, of life. And you're truly a global citizen, I guess. <laughs> It's just so interesting to think like up until I was 16, I only lived in Belgrade. I hardly even knew my, like, I, I only knew like the area where I lived. Yeah. I went to like Greece a couple of times, but like nothing really. And then from 16, 17, it's like, this whole new life, which is exciting because I love to change. I love to learn new things now. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really the, the, the second part of my life is asking myself who's in control of my life, right? Like, where do I want to go? What do I want to do? So um, I don't know if you make any plans, you know, for the future, but um, yeah, let's, let's just, you know, speak a little bit about, what you're doing right now you have your mindset coaching as well like what what you know are your plans for the future for sure. you specifically not just moving you know and living someplace yeah. but so you know life. sharing the information about mindset is very important to me i feel like that's my mission that's my purpose is everything that i've been through and changed my mindset and worked on my mindset and still changing it's constantly changing uh, i feel like it's important for people to understand that because I know how I used to think and I know how a lot of people think. And the hardest thing to understand and to accept is that we are responsible for ourselves. Um, so once I got that and once I started taking control over my life, everything started changing. So um, I moved into mindset coaching to really help people with their limiting beliefs, because that's that's really what it comes down to. Um, and then I started creating courses. I got, I really, really, really feel strongly about meditation, but a lot of people misunderstand meditation thinking like, oh, I just can't quit. So I create five to 10 minute long meditations for beginners, basically, um, to really work on the inner beliefs because it's so powerful to, uh, to get to your subconscious through meditation and to get the messages through that you want. So I'm creating, uh, um, Uh, a challenge and a membership on that. And then I wrote a couple of books. I can, I'm, I want to continue writing. And one thing that I want to really get into is um, public speaking. I know that that like, I've always loved public speaking. And I know that that's like number one fear that people have, but I absolutely love it, which is why I know I have to use it. Yeah. So my, my goal is to become a public speaker by next year and to start having traveling basically the world, mainly United States. Um, and having speeches and hopefully, you know, moving people in the right direction. And then in Mexico, I have a friend who's also a coach. She's more focused on the business side of things. And she and I want to create retreats for people. Three days, seven days, however many days people can get away for, where we really work on the limiting beliefs, the mindset, the way we talk to ourselves, setting goals, you know, mission, purpose, and things like that. So that's the a bigger goal. Wow. That sounds fantastic. And obviously uh, I'm very curious to see what life has, you know, stored for you over the next couple of years. Um, Absolutely. Thank well, you. you know, Lex, thank you so much. That was such an interesting conversation that we had. Um, I felt, you know, it, it was very, very moving and, um, you know, speaking to a fellow European and also someone who, you know, who this country yeah. went through um, also a very, you know, turbulent history. Um, it's just, it's interesting for me right. to talk to someone who, you know, somewhat understands. Um, so, Absolutely. Yeah. It's been fun. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much. 
Speaking to Lex about her experience of growing up in her home country has been really eye-opening for me. Because we almost grew up at the exact same time. And very close to each other. But with vastly different memories. Of course, I knew about the war that was going on. And we had a lot of people in Germany who actually fled from those countries. So I grew up with people who experienced something similar. But still, I was so close and yet so far away. This episode really means a lot to me. Because I think it is a lesson for all of us. Some countries are so close to us and we hear about a lot of things in the media. But do we really know what people are experiencing in those countries? Probably not. So thank you, Lex, for sharing your often hurtful memories and for also giving us an exclusive look behind what it was actually like to grow up in a country that was experiencing war. It definitely gives a whole new definition of change. The Metamorphosis Podcast is produced by Aaron Howe in the United States and me, Nora Brucker in Germany. Thank you to all of our supporters. And of course, a huge thank you to our guests who are telling us their stories from around the globe about change and life-changing moments. For more information about each episode, check out officialmetamorphosispodcast.com and follow us on Instagram at officialmetamorphosispodcast for an exclusive look behind the scenes and our guests. We're happy for you to leave your thoughts on each episode and we are very much looking forward to hearing from you. This is the Metamorphosis Podcast with Erin Nora.